Chapter Eight of the Great K and A Train Robbery by Paul Lester Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight: How Did the Secret Leak Out? I made up for my three nights' lack of sleep by not waking the next morning till after ten. When I went to two eighteen, I found only the chef, and he told me the party had gone for a ride. Since I couldn't talk to Madge, I went to work at my desk, for I had been rather neglecting my routine work. While I still wrote, I heard horses' hoofs, and looking up, saw the Cullens returning. I went out on the platform to wish them good morning, arriving just in time to see Lord Rails help Miss Cullen out of her saddle and the way he did it, and the way he continued to hold her hand after she was down, while he said something to her, made me grit my teeth and look the other way. None of the riders had seen me, so I slipped into my car and went back to work. Fred came in presently to see if I was up yet and to ask me to lunch, but I felt so miserable and downhearted that I made an excuse of my late breakfast for not joining them. After luncheon, the party in the other special all came out and walked up and down the platform, the sound of their voices and laughter only making me feel the bluer. Before long I heard a rap on one of my windows, and there was Miss Cullen peering in at me. The moment I looked up she called, "'Won't you make one of us, Mr. Misanthrope?' I called myself all sorts of a fool, but out I went as eagerly as if there had been some hope. Miss Cullen began to tease me over my sudden access of energy, declaring that she was sure it was a pose for their benefit, or else due to a guilty conscience over having slept so late. I hoped you would ride with us, though perhaps it wouldn't have paid you. Apparently there is nothing to see in Ash Forks. There is something that may interest you all, I suggested, pointing to a special that had been dropped off number two that morning. What is it? asked Madge. It's a G.S. special, I said, and Mr. Camp and Mr. Baldwin and two G.S. officials came in on it. What do you think he'd give for those letters? laughed Fred. If they were worth so much to you, I suppose they can't be worth any less to the G.S., I replied. Fortunately, there is no way that he can learn where they are, said Mr. Cullen. Don't let's stand still, cried Miss Cullen. Mr. Gordon, I'll run you a race to the end of the platform. She said this only after getting a big lead, and she got there about eight inches ahead of me, which pleased her mightily. It takes men so long to get started, was the way she explained her victory. Then she walked me beyond the end of the boarding to explain the workings of a switch to her. That it was only a pretext, she proved to me the moment I had relocked the bar by saying, Mr. Gordon, may I ask you a question? Certainly, I assented. It is one I should ask Papa or Fred, but I am afraid they might not tell me the truth. You will, won't you? she begged very earnestly. I will, I promised. Supposing, she continued, that it became known that you have those letters, would it do our side any harm? I thought for a moment, and then shook my head. No new proxies could arrive here in time for the election, I said, and the ones I have will not be voted. She still looked doubtful, and asked, then why did Papa say just now, fortunately? He merely meant that it was safer they shouldn't know. Then it is better to keep it a secret, she asked anxiously. I suppose so, I said, and then added, why should you be afraid of asking your father? Because he might, well, if he knew, I'm sure he would sacrifice himself, and I couldn't run the risk. I am afraid I don't understand, I questioned. I would rather not explain, she said, and of course that ended the subject. Our exercise taken, we went back to the Cullen's car, and Madge left us to write some letters. 
A moment later Lord Rails remembered he had not written home recently, and he too went forward to the dining-room. That made me call myself something for not having offered Miss Cullen the use of my desk in ninety-seven. Owing to this, the two missed part of the big game we were playing, for barely were they gone when one of the servants brought a card to Mr. Cullen, who looked at it and exclaimed, Mr. Camp! Then, after a speaking pause, in which we all exchanged glances, he said, Bring him in. On Mr. Camp's entrance he looked as much surprised as we had all done a moment before. I beg your pardon for intruding, Mr. Cullen, he said. I was told that this was Mr. Gordon's car, and I wish to see him. I am Mr. Gordon. You are travelling with Mr. Cullen? he inquired, with a touch of suspicion in his manner. No, I answered. My special is the next car, and I was merely enjoying a cigar here. Ah, said Mr. Camp then I won't interrupt your smoke, and will only relieve you of those letters of mine." I took a good pull at my cigar, and blew the smoke out in a cloud slowly to gain time. "'I don't think I follow you,' I said. "'I understand that you have in your possession three letters addressed to me.' "'I have,' I assented. "'Then I will ask you to deliver them to me. I can't do that. Why not? he challenged. They're my property. I produced the Postmaster General's telegram and read it to him. Why, this is infamous, Mr. Camp cried. What use will those letters be after the eighteenth? It's a conspiracy. I can only obey instructions, I said. It shall cost you your position if you do, Mr. Camp threatened. As I've already said, I haven't a good temper, and when he told me that, I couldn't help retorting, that's quite on par with most G.S. methods. I'm not speaking for the G.S., young man, roared Mr. Camp. I speak as a director of the Kansas and Arizona. What is more, I will have those letters inside of twenty-four hours. He made an angry exit, and I said to Fred, I wish you would stroll about and spy out the proceedings of the enemy's camp. He may telegraph to Washington, and if there's any chance of the Postmaster General revoking his order, I must go back to Fladstaff on number four this afternoon. He shan't do anything that I don't know about till he goes to bed, Fred promised. But how the deuce did he know that you had those letters? That was just what we were all puzzling over, for only the occupants of number 218 and myself, so far as I knew, were in a position to let Mr. Camp hear of that fact. As Fred made his exit, he said, Don't tell Madge that there is a new complication, for the dear girl has had worries enough already. Miss Cullen not rejoining us, and Lord Rails presently doing so, I went to my own car, for he and I were not good furniture for the same room. Before I had been there long, Fred came rushing in. Camp and Baldwin have been in consultation with a lawyer, he said, and now the three have just boarded those cars, pointing out the window at the branch line train that was to leave for Phoenix in two minutes. You must go with them, I urged and keep us informed as to what they do, for they evidently are going to set the law on us, and the G.S. has always owned the territorial judges, so they'll stretch a point to oblige them. Have I time to fill a bag? Plenty, I assured him, and going out, I ordered the train held till I should give the word. What does it all mean? asked Miss Cullen, joining me. I laughed and replied, I'm doing a braver thing even than your party did. I'm holding up a train all by my lonesome. But my brother came dashing in just now and said he was starting for Phoenix. Let her go, I called to the conductor, as Fred jumped aboard, and the train pulled out. 
I hope there's nothing wrong, Madge questioned anxiously. Nothing to worry over, I laughed. Only a little more fun for our money. By the way, Miss Cullen, I went on to avoid her questions, if you have your letters ready, and will let me have them at once, I can get them on number four so that they'll go east to-night. Miss Cullen blushed, as if I had said something I ought not to have, and stammered, I, I, I changed uh, my mind, and uh, that is, um, I, I didn't write them, after all. I beg your pardon. I ought to have known. I, I mean, it's very natural, I faltered and stuttered, thinking what a dunce I had been not to understand that both hers and Lord Rayle's letters had been only a pretext to get away from the rest of us. My blundering apology and evident embarrassment deepened Miss Cullen's blush fivefold, and she exclaimed hurriedly, I found I was tired, and so, instead of writing, I went to my room and rested. I suppose any girl would have invented the same yarn, yet it hurt me more than the bigger one she had told on Hans's trail. Small as the incident was, it made me very blue, and led me to shut myself up in my own car for the rest of that afternoon and evening. Indeed, I couldn't sleep, but sat up working, quite forgetful of the passing hours, till a glance at my watch startled me with the fact that it was a quarter of two. Feeling like anything more than sleep, I went out on the platform and, lighting a cigar, paced up and down, thinking of, well, thinking. The night agent was sitting in the station, nodding, and after I had walked for an hour I went in to ask him if the train to Phoenix had arrived on time. Just as I opened the door, the telegraph instrument began clicking and called Ash Forks. The man, with the curious ability that operators get of recognizing their own call, even in sleep, waked up instantly and responded, and not wishing to interrupt him, I delayed asking my question till he should be free. I stood there thinking of Madge, and listening heedlessly as the instrument ticked off the cipher signature of the sending operator, and the twenty-four paid. But as I heard the clicks, dit 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 which meant P.H., I suddenly became attentive, and when it completed Phoenix, I concluded Fred was wiring me, and listened for what followed the date. This is what the instrument ticked. Reader's note. Here follows an illustration of a long sequence of dots and dashes. That may not look particularly intelligible, but if the Phoenix operator had been talking over the phone to me, he couldn't have said any plainer. Sheriff, Yavapai County, Ash Forks, Arizona, be at railroad station 345 today, to meet train arriving from Phoenix, prepared to immediately serve peremptory mandamus issued tonight by Judge Wilson, Sig Theodore E. Camp. My question being pretty thoroughly answered, I went back and continued my walk, but before five minutes had passed, the operator came out and handed me a message. It was from Fred, and read thus, Camp Baldwin and lawyer went at once to house of Judge Wilson, where they stayed an hour. They then returned with Judge to station, and after dispatching a telegram, have taken seats in train for Ash Forks, leaving here at 325. I shall return with them. A bigger idiot than I could have understood the move. I was to be hauled before Judge Wilson by means of mandamus proceedings, and as he was notoriously a G.S. judge, and was coming to Ash Forks solely to oblige Mr. Camp, he would unquestionably declare the letters the property of Mr. Camp and order their delivery. Apparently I had my choice of being a traitor to Madge, of going to prison for contempt of court, or of running away which was not far off from acknowledging that I had done something wrong. I didn't like any 
of the options. End of chapter 8